Thank you to Herman Marshall Whiskey for sponsoring another episode of Suds with Luds. Herman Marshall produces small batch, handcrafted, and award-winning whiskey, patiently aged in new white oak barrels. Whether it's their Texas bourbon, Texas rye, Texas single malt, or their blended bourbon whiskey, all are built from the grain up, just like good whiskey should be. Make sure you ask for it by name. Thank you again, Herman Marshall Whiskey. Welcome into another show here, uh, formerly known as Suds with Luds, no longer. It is now Suds with Rads, John Radican and Luds. Uh, welcome back, Rads. Good to see you. Two weeks in a row. Yeah, I'm glad to be back. And uh, what the heck? I mean, you know, hockey season's underway. Let's crack a cold one for that. Oh, you switched on there me. There you go. I got, your, you go. I got your brand yeah, this well, week. You switched on me. Uh, I know. Well, man, our, our, our crew... I've been pumping the tires here for my Miller Lite, which you have in your hand now, yeah. for a long time. And they're getting nowhere with Miller Lite. So I figure I'll, I'll hit a Corona today. Okay. You can go with the Miller Lite. Well, what did you have last week? I, had, had uh, I saw the green bottle. Yeah, I had... Uh, Dos Equis? No, 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 no. It was Canadian. I, I did a Canadian beer for you. Uh, oh, that's oh, right. Oh, I did um, Moosehead. It was Moosehead. Oh yeah, there you go. Well, that's pretty appropriate. Is that <laughs> kind of me on the me on the bottom? <laughs> what I'm saying, yeah, <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. So anybody anybody that's got hookups with Moosehead, maybe maybe that's the appropriate yeah, can. Yeah, there. We need something that's got two animals on it. Maybe we got something a picture of a couple different animals on it. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, we'll get a beer sponsor. I promise you. It's Suds with Luds. It's hockey season, <laughs> man. There you go. Hey, man, it is hockey season. We're getting ready. Yeah. Training camp mm. opened. Uh, As we get going. Yeah, it's cool yep. for me, you know, um, having been a little bit more disassociated with hockey the last few years with my, my role. It's so awesome to jump back into this thing when legitimately, you know, DeBoer and Nil and the players are talking about, hey, it's it's a Stanley Cup, you know, goal, right? It's a we want to make it to the Stanley Cup finals. I mean, of course, every team does, but there's a legitimate shot at it. When you look at what the Stars have done three of the last five years losing to the eventual Stanley Cup champion. Well, I think every team that, that is not every team, but every team for the most part that has had success in the finals and won a Stanley Cup, it's a process. And, and I'm sure that's applies to most of the sports teams. And I think when you're talking about Dallas, the window's been open for two to three years. Yeah. They've got the goaltender. Um, we we know that they've got a couple big time goal scorers. Um, my my thing will always be with the decor. Uh, I I think that we saw a couple holes, not major holes, like small potholes, last year against the team that ultimately went on to win it. And but you right. do have to give credit to the team that won it in the Vegas because they they were. And they're they're back. they got the exact same team this year, and wow. they are big, they are strong, and I think the reason, one of the major reasons that they won the cup, was their decor, uh, led by the yeah. salary cap always comes yeah. into play. So, you know, your your hands are kind of tied, um, depending. And you know, I think I believe that they've been at the cap. Le Petrangelo, who was a former St. Louis Blue, uh, won a cup in St. Louis, came in there, and and he is. Uh, he he's what makes that that in my opinion he he's what makes that thing go. So, of course, yeah. I I I think when it comes to Dallas, what Dallas did in the off season, I, I thought they were going to add. And again, met uh, you know for the last few years. So, Jim Nail goes out and does what he can and gives the bullets to the coaches to you know and put them in the right chamber. Um, I thought they would try to find a defenseman. Um, it, which isn't easy. So it, right. I'm sure, I'm sure they, they, you know, they scoured everything. Um, but then when you talk about Vegas winning the cup last year, they did not have, uh, a, a, what, what I think a lot of people would consider a number one goaltender. Right. And so they were able to do it with everything in front of the goaltender where our philosophy has always be, you start from the, the goaltender, the defenseman, the forwards, you start from, from your D zone and build out and you build up through the middle of the ice. So in other words, when you get to the forwards, you got centermen, you know, and they've got Rupe Hintz. Um, Wyatt Johnson, I think is going to continue to just 
Grohl. Tyler Sagan, Radek Foxa, um, I think his role is getting a little bit reduced. But anyway, um, the addition that they made this year was bringing in Matt Duchesne. Yeah. Matt Duchesne, um, I believe, was in Colorado, or sorry, in uh, Nashville yeah. uh, this past year, yeah. uh, I believe. And so right. they got him at a reduced rate, uh, skilled player. So my whole thing is, are you trying to outscore what you give up maybe because of a defenseman or two on your back end. So we'll see. But like I said, they're they're in great hands. As a matter of fact, Jim Neal was uh, general manager of the year. So yeah. who's to second guess what Jim Neal has done? He's only done made the right moves. And he did it. You know what? And he did it on, you know, I wouldn't say one foot in a grave and one on a banana peel. But, you know, he was coming to the end of his um his contract, yeah. and I believe they gave him a couple of years they just did. prior. So, they did. so it, it should be exciting. Well, it should be an exciting the, year with the Dallas The Stars. amazing thing is, you know, two years ago, the year before DeBoer came in, as good as this team was, the rub was kind of basically that they can't score, right? They didn't have enough offense. And suddenly, he turned right. that thing around like that. Now, as a D-man, does that change in philosophy because that's what it is does that change bother you uh for the long-term sustained success or potential success for this team it, it doesn't bother me whatsoever because uh, what what pete DeBoer has done is he's gotten he wants the defenseman to be involved i think the coaches prior to i mean the game has changed over the last few coaches i mean Maybe the last one, Dave Tippett, was more a little bit more old school, uh, but he also wanted his defenseman to get involved. And I think every coach after that, uh, just like every other team, you have the teams are so good and well structured through through most areas of the ice that you have to add another attacker. And and I think what what Pete does, and and it's not to say that Pete, I mean Bones knew the same thing. Yeah. When you've got a guy back there like Miro Haskinen, um, you need to let that horse run free. And, and, you know, so, and they have, and that's what they did. And so, like I say, sometimes are you trying to say, we're going to try to outscore any deficiencies we have. My only problem with Dallas last year was how they played in their own zone. And there were some glaring, uh, I don't want to say missed coverage because I, I don't obviously know exactly what their system is, but it looked like it was a man on man system. And there were times when, and I know that Ryan Suter got nailed by whether it be the press and some fans and, but Ryan Suter has been around the league for a long time. Uh, he's 38, I think he is right now, 38, 39. Um, and his minutes have been reduced. He's always been one of the guys that's at the top of the NHL when it comes to minutes played. Um, but but sometimes it looks like he was the goat in plays, and, and I don't know. It's like he would take himself and follow a guy around in his own zone, and it would open up other lanes and open up open areas of the ice. So, But that could be the system that they're playing. They could be playing man-on-man, -man and that's what they're supposed to do, and somebody else is supposed to cover other guys. So my only criticism, I think, in the playoffs last year was just what happened in their defensive zone at times. So I, and I'm guaranteed that they have they have scoured the, all of that and they've gone through that over the past two or three or four months, whatever the time frame will be. And they, but again, I, I think that um, I expect Dallas to be at the top of their division this year. Um, Colorado. It sounds like uh, Landeskog, their captain, is not going to be back for the regular season, if at all. Um, so that's a big hole. Um, I think St. Louis, who I'm a big fan of their general manager, Doug Armstrong, they're, I don't want to say in the, they're in a rebuild. Um, they're a little, they're tweaking their lineup. Um, they just had to name a new captain. So Braden Shen, I believe, is going to be their captain. They were without a captain. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, and then Arizona is Arizona. Yeah. Uh, Minnesota, th they've got some handcuffs on only because of Suter and uh, Parise, their contracts. They're they're playing at a disadvantage there. They're, they're 14 million under the salary cap because of the, the dollar amount that they had to pay those two players. So but, so they're, 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 I, I expect Dallas to be at the top, but again, for me, that's never really been a big thing. Just, you know, get to the dance. Yeah. Um, so, but, but I think it's going to be, and I think you're going to see a couple new players in the lineup here and there throughout the season, some young prospects that they have. I think they're going to get a chance. So I believe it's still going to, it's really going to be an exciting team again. Yeah. It's going to be a really deep team. It's amazing when you think of the spine of it, though. Uh, you've got one of the best goalies in the league, arguably the best. You've got, one of the best young and maybe one of the best defensemen in the league in Hiskinen. And then you've got all that.
talent and power up front. Um, it's a pretty good spine of this organization. One of the things I thought was really interesting in the offseason, too, Luds, is that Hiskinen came out and said, I've been working on my shot, mm-hmm. right? I mean, like, you, you're, you don't need to work on anything, and yet that's what the great ones do. We remember, you know, we're old enough to remember the days when Larry Bird would leave for a season and he'd come back and all of a sudden he could shoot the three, and you're like, what the hell, Larry Bird shooting threes? He doesn't shoot threes, right? He learned it in the offseason. This sounds like this is what Miro is doing. It also seems like it is a, a nod to, this is great, because DeBoer wants me more involved offensively, so by God, I'm going to work on my shot. And on top of that, he's come out and said he wants the North. He, he, he wants to, to be recognized as the best defenseman in the league. And how often do you hear, and I don't, I don't know if we call Miro a young player, but he yeah. still is. Yeah, he is. Um, but, you know, he's got, he's got some, he's got games under his belt now. And, and to be able to come out, and Miro is, in my opinion, not that kind of, he is not a brass guy. He's not a bragger. But, right. But he, I think that, to me, what it shows is when you make that statement that you want to be recognized to be the best defenseman in the league, there's a confidence there. And I think he's a soft-spoken player. Um, he knows what his role is. He knows that this team counts on him. And I, well, I think he's a big reason that I – mean, one of the reasons that that they didn't bring John Klingberg back yeah. because they saw what Miro can do. Klinger probably wanted you know a, a big pay raise. That, that wasn't going to work. Um so they're like, well, listen, <laughs> you, you want an extra four million. Um, we got a kid back here that we believe is going to be able to step into your into your shoes. And, and he has. And, and he is he is like there's no doubt he's a top defenseman right now. Could be a top three. Um, and then I think what helps that when you're when you want that uh, acknowledgement, I wish there was two different awards. I, I wish there was a, a an award for the defensive defenseman. And the Norris. It used to go to now. I don't want to say more of a defensive defenseman, but I mean Chris Chelios. Yeah. Uh, won I don't know three three of them, but Chelios didn't have a hundred points a year. But he was just he was a good defenseman. He was hard to play against. He was a leader. He did the things offensively, but he was more of a rounded one. I think you can go back and you can look at a lot of those defensemen. But but Eric Carlson, who needs an invitation at times to get down to his own end of the rink, had a hundred and some points last year and won the Norris as best defenseman in the NHL. And now, now, now he's going to go to Pittsburgh and, you know, and he's going to help the big three there in Pittsburgh and see what they can do. But, but Miro, um, I think, I think Miro's trying to be a, a, a better all around defenseman. And, you know, and again, like a Sergei Zuba, Zuba, Zuby never got enough credit for what he did in his own end, but he was just magical uh, when he had the puck on his stick, just ask Madano and Lettinen and Hull. Yeah, no doubt about it. And so it's Miro in a way, uh, this change and this, uh, this approach that he's taken in the off season is him sort of, you know, testing the wind. Okay. So if I'm going to win the Norris in this day and age, I might need to be a hundred point guy as well as being strong in my own end. A hundred percent. And, but that, but, and you would think he should be able to get there. And yeah. again, I, it'll be very interesting for me. They, they added another bullet to their gun. If Matt Duchesne can come in here and I don't know who he's going to play with, but he plays with, for instance, Sagan and uh, Marshan. I, I don't know where they're going to have them, but, uh, it's another weapon on the power play for sure. He, he's a he's an unbelievably skilled puck handler, passer. Um, so I think that lends to offense, which Miro will be in and will be able to take advantage of that. But, uh, you know, you got Hans Pavelski, Robertson. You, you know Miro can grab points there. There's no question, especially on the power play. And, you know, then you, you got Wyatt Johnson, 20-plus uh, goals last night. Dodonov came in here and was a real good addition um, after being on, uh, I don't know what it was, four or five teams in six or seven years, came in here and, and did an incredible job. And I, I just think that now what they have is if, if Matt Duchesne – can get back to the form that Matt Duchesne was when in his younger years, being this flashy, in, incredibly skilled player. Now all of a sudden you got three three lines you got to worry about. Uh, real hard to match up against from opposing teams. You know, pick your poison. And um, and the, you know, and again, it's uh, I've texted a few times back and forth with Joe Pavelski. Joe's gonna thirty nine years old, but Joe plays the game from the from the shoulders up. So yeah. forget about his foot speed and what he's going to be able to do the same things with with hints and Robo that that he did last year. I believe. I mean, of course, there's you know the only one defeated in this whole sports industry is Father Time, and so yeah. that that day will come. 
Um, but what I really, really appreciate about Joe Pavelski is his commitment to play and stay in this organization. You know, he's reduced every year. You know, I, I think after he came off a contract, he, he took four or five million or something like that. Then he went down, I believe, this year. So that's sending the right message. I had I was beating the drum two years ago, and I just said, if I'm Jim Nell, I'm finding a way to get this guy not just locked up for this team, but to get locked up for this organization if he wants it. Because I just think what he did with Wyatt Johnson, he took Wyatt yeah. in last year. Unbelievable. Um, you know, so he was living with him. Yeah, I mean, what what a better mentor. <laughs> you right. know, to be to live with somebody like Joe Pavelski and and all the knowledge and hockey sense and everything that he has. But for me, uh, if there's not conversations, there should be of what. Joe can do for this organization whenever he wants to put the skates away. Uh, and I, uh, when I look at his numbers and things like that, uh, he hasn't, you know, won, you know, the MVP of the league. He hasn't won a scoring title. He hasn't won a Stanley cup, but for me, he's on that hall of fame. You know, he's in that, that neighborhood. Um, does he need to win one of those major awards? I think they kind of look at that kind of stuff. So, but, but just an all around perfect guy to have with this, this group. And that's why it even feels more, um, what urgent, right. To win this year. Cause you know, cause mm -hmm. next year he's going to be 40. Yep. And as you mentioned, father time, you yep. know, he just keeps coming. And so it'd be awesome. Wouldn't it to see, uh, Joe Pavelski go out with the Stanley Cup, you know, as his, uh, I mean, a little bit like yours was, right? What That was your last year, wasn't it? When, yeah. when, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh yeah, I, I I was just gonna say that you know, and I if if Dallas wins the cup, it's presented to Jamie Ben. It will be handed to Joe Pavelski yeah. next. I mean, that's always the, that's always a talk, right? Uh, who's gonna get the cup after the captain gets it? Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I look at Carbo and I. You know, Carbo and I were fortunate to win it when we were younger in Montreal, right. and so it was right. thirteen years in between for yeah. me. And and you know, and I wasn't even coming back. I was not going to come back that year. I, I was going to end it the year before. I got talked into coming back, and you know, you, you don't think you're going to get to taste it again, and it's hungry, and and you want to be part of it, and especially when you're with a club like this. And that's where I look at Joe. I mean, he, he knows the kind of team that, that he's playing on right now. They, they've got the ability to do this and, you know, and you cross your fingers because, you know, what always comes into play as long as everybody stays healthy, uh, especially at the right time of the year. Yeah. Um, that's important. So, um, and, I, and I think they got the right coach. I, I mean, I know when I talked to uh, the former, Kel Kelly's no longer with the team. Kelly Forbes, our video guy, has moved on. Um, I remember talking to Kelly at one of our podcast things last year and, and they had just hired uh, Pete and I just said, "Hey, what do you think about the new coach?" And he goes, "He's incredible." And, and it was more because it was almost like less is more. He wanted the players to be able to play, and, and he says, just from the standpoint of what we're going to do and when we're going to start, it's like, "Oh no, we don't have to start yet. We can. We got time to do that, and let's just relax and things like that." So I and I would assume that that rolls over into the room to, into the players and the, and the players. You wanna you wanna run your own team, and you don't want. Mike Babcock running your team, which <laughs> there's your segue. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I thought I'd help you out with that one. Uh, you know, so so I, I think that I don't want to say he's a player's coach. I don't even know if there are those kind of things anymore. I mean, there have been a few. I, Pat Burns for me, and and you know, guys uh, have. Yes, when you get a whole group of guys, which I don't know how you keep a whole group happy because everybody wants to play, you know, a lot. But I think when you have everybody pretty much saying the same thing about the coaching staff, man, that's a that's a big, big sign uh, of everybody pulling on the rope the same way. Yeah, it's a great point. And especially, uh, you know, I think not only the players and the front office, but guys who are in the trenches there, you know, other assistant coaches, even those who mm -hmm. had been inherited, you know, they see those things. And that definitely speaks volumes about a, how a guy comes in and about how he, you know, conducts himself in that role. So, but yeah, you did mention Babcock. And I was going to say, we get to talk lots of stars. They're off and running in training camp. We can't wait to talk all season about what's going to be a great team. But let's talk about this this hot news in hockey and the fact that you know Mike Babcock will never even coach a game for the Columbus Blue Jackets because of uh, you know this this incident that happened uh, you know even before even before a couple of days before training camp opened for those guys and he has essentially stepped down but you know he was basically told to step down so um, talk about this what what do you think about the the Blue Jackets getting rid of Babcock on the doorstep of training camp. Uh, super unfortunate for the organization. And, you know, it's appropriate, maybe, that I'm drinking Corona Light. 
or Corona because he may want to get a hold of Snoop Dogg because the next time you're going to see him is probably doing a beer commercial <laughs> because when you say he's not going to coach again this year, I do not believe he's ever going to coach again in the NHL. Yeah. Um, for, for people that haven't heard, Mike Bobcock, as we record this, was – uh, released uh, what just just under a week ago, um, but and and what happened is he came into and I don't know Mike Babcock never had to play for him or never played for him I shouldn't say had um, when he was interviewing his players to meet his new team in Columbus after being hired and going through the interview process with uh, Yaro Kekalainen and, and J D John Davidson the the president and the GM of the team um, he was asking players to see their cell phones. And he wa- he said he wanted to get to know the players. And um, he was going through their camera rolls, is from what I understand. And um, a couple of the older guys, uh, the captain and Johnny Goudreau, didn't make much of it. Older players. I Again, they're older guys. And, man, you know how it is with kids. I mean, I don't know if there's anything more important than their phones and what they hold sacred. But, but as a young player and you've got your coach – scrolling through your cell phone, I would say it's a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and it's, you know, so ultimately what happened is a couple of players said something and uh, credit to, to the guys over at Spit and Chicklets because Paul Bissonette, who does the TNT stuff, does a great job there. Um, and Ryan Whitney, these guys have context yet in players. And so somehow people were reaching out to Biz or Biz was going back and forth with them. And um, he was getting some some feedback on what was going on. And so they came out uh, via social media. They were pretty hard on Babcock. And um, I think that just kind of snowballed. And then they ultimately took a little deeper dive, meaning management, into what was going on. And I think some of the players, uh, some of the younger guys especially, probably expressed their feelings how uncomfortable it was. And so they ultimately um, released them. And... Um, he had just signed uh, a two-year deal, $4 million a year. And when a question was asked in the press conference um, to John Davidson, the president of the club, uh, about his contract, you know, is this null and void now or what is it? And all they said is we, we, we came to an agreement. So Babcock is going to come in and he never coached a team. He never got a training camp with the team. Um, had some meetings with some players apparently. And he is now probably going to get some money. I, I, nothing's been disclosed about all that kind of stuff. And you know, it's funny because I go back to last year doing a couple podcasts, and I did one. The first one I did, I, I it was with uh, Chris Chelios, and I knew that Chelly had played for Babcock, and I, I asked Chelly about him, and Chelly didn't have a lot of good things to say. You know, I, I get it. He's, he, you know, he what he did to Mike Madonna. You know, that was the icing on the cake. You know, One game the end, short, not, right? Two, yeah, he healthy scratched him two games, last two games of the year that meant nothing. Uh, to to not let him play his fifteen hundredth game, and his quote was, "He's not here, you know, to play fifteen hundred games. He's here to help us win the Stanley Cup. So what's he doing in the playoffs? He healthy scratches him, and then Mo plays game six against San Jose, gets two points. We beat them seven two. It's the best game we had of the series." What does he do game seven? Healthy scratches him. We lose in overtime. So he's a jackass, plain and simple, this guy. And there's a reason why he's not coaching now. It's not because of his coaching ability. You know, it's because of the antics that he pulls and the games that he plays. And Kenny Holland would bring guys in, and he would not play them despite Kenny to show Kenny that, he, you know, he's going to have that last decision, which, you know, Kenny said that's his decision to play in the lineup. But, you know, all the stuff he pulled in Toronto and, you know, what he did to the kid – what was the name uh, Spezza from Ottawa? His first game yeah, back, and he healthy yeah. scratches him. There's no need for that. There's too many good people in hockey, and you don't need a guy like that, you know, doing that stuff. And like I said, I, I wouldn't be shocked if someone hires him again. You know, somebody in Canada probably will hire him. But uh, yeah, he like I said, not my favorite guy. But it, like I said, it's you know water under the bridge. I don't hate Mike Babcock anymore. I, you know, he's nothing to me, quite honestly. Well, wait, let's not get over the bridge yet. Let's talk about the okay, Winter Classic. I still hate him. I the, still hate him. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> let's tell the story about the Winter Classic game. Oh, so he uh, he's trying now for the, the, the four days before that. He's telling I'm not playing. He just called me. And said, so he wants a reaction out of me. I said, okay, whatever. Kenny Holland and Jim Nill told him he's playing. He's in the lineup. It's his hometown. You're not going to embarrass him like that. 
So what does he do? He suits up seven defensemen, which he never does. Suits up Anders Lilia, who's from Sweden and has never seen Wrigley Field, doesn't know anything about Wrigley Field, like he cares. Who doesn't want to play an outdoor game? So he suits up seven defensemen, puts me in the starting lineup, plays me two shifts, and benches me the rest of the game. So halfway through the first, I figured out, I look back at Brad McCrimmon, and I go, what's going on? He goes, he told me not to play the rest of the game. I'm like, okay. So my two sons are... 20 feet away on the, you know, on the glass watching the game. They're looking at me and they're shrugging their shoulders. What's going on? So I called Jake over. I said, go tell those trainers, go get me a couple beers. So my other son, Dean, like he's a goody two shoe Dean. Oh, he doesn't like doing it. He goes, dad, no, no, no. I go, yeah, I'm not playing anymore. So go get me some beers. So no one knew like not one guy in the team. I sat in the end of the bench. No one knew had a clue what I was doing. So Come third period, we get a penalty with two minutes left in the game, and McCrimmon says, you got to go out there. I said, not a chance. My feet hurt, and I'm cold. So I didn't go out there. We got scored against, and Babcock lost his mind that I didn't go out there. But I was in the bar across the street at Murphy's before he even got to the dressing room, so he didn't get a chance. <laughs> he didn't get a chance to get at me until two days later at the rink. But, yeah, like I said, it was, again, senseless what he tried doing. And, uh, you know, I, and, and to get even with him, I healthy scratched myself later in the year to go watch my son Jake in Pittsburgh win the national championship. And I didn't tell Babs. I told Kenny Holland I was going. And that's when I got Babs. That was the, the greatest day of my life. His veins were popping out of his neck, his head. Looked like he was going to blow up the next day when he says if he runs a team. <laughs> so, And uh, the next was uh, – actually, the, the next one was Mike Commodore. Uh, Commie had played for – Carolina, uh, he was with Babcock in Detroit. He was with them, I believe, in Anaheim, uh, a couple of teams, and has nothing good to say about him and how he treated him and kind of dangling ice time and things like that. That never came through a contract, and he agreed to a contract after talking to Babs and um, then didn't play. Um, and my big thing with Babs, so now, you know, years ago, I go to Calgary, Babs goes to Detroit and Carolina, whatever. I'm in Columbus now. I rip him in the paper when I'm in Columbus the first time Detroit comes to town um, I find out Chelly and Osgood those guys cut out the articles highlight the parts where I'm ripping them because they loved it we ended up beating Detroit in overtime I actually had a couple of points I assisted on the overtime winner I'll never forget I was so <laughs> pumped um, anyways things go sideways in Columbus on me and uh, I'm now bought out now this is my big thing with Babs uh, so Bought out at the, end of, at the end of June, sorry. Free agency starts the next day. I'm friends with Ken Holland, who is the general manager of Detroit. Babs is the head coach in Detroit. I'm friends with Ken. I played in his, a couple of his golf events. I've had beers with him, ripping on Babs, whatever. I like Ken, though. Ken likes me. So end of June, talk to my agent. He's like, yeah, it's probably going to be, you know, you're getting, obviously you're bought out. Maybe you get another chance. Maybe wait something in August. I go, cool, sounds good. Next day. Phone rings. I'm in Kelowna, British Columbia. It's five minutes into free agency. My agent, he's like, hey, I got a contract offer. I'm like, cool. I go, well, what is it? He's like, one year, one million bucks. I'm like, awesome. I'm not going to get any more than that coming off a buyout. I'm like, well, who is it? He's like, Detroit. This agent was different than when I had Babs the first time. And I say, well, I'm not going to Detroit. There's only one reason why Babs wants me in Detroit, and that's to end my career. This is my last opportunity. I understand this. If he doesn't, if I go there and he doesn't play me at all, I'm done. Tell him the story a little bit. He's like, well, I'm like, just put them off. Like literally free agency just started. Nobody, no other team is thinking of calling me for weeks, like to put them off or something. <laughs> My agent goes, well, Ken told me, he said, tell Mike that he's got 15 minutes to make up his mind. We either need to know he's in or he's out. If he's not in, in 15 minutes, I'm going a different direction. So now I'm like, are you shitting me? So I'm like, I'll call you back to my agent. So I call Ken Holland. I'm like, Ken, I'm like, I'd love to play for you. I would love to play in Detroit. I'm like, you guys are good. You're going to make the playoffs. I'm like, I love playing in Joe Lewis Arena. I'm like, I would love to play in Detroit. But I'm like, you know what I think you're head coach. Is it you that wants me? Does he want me to? Is he going to, is he going to screw me over? No, you know, he says he wants you. I'm like, Ken, do you believe him? He's like, yeah, I do believe in this time. I go, give me his number. Give me his number. I call Babs. Hey, Mike. I go, Babs, I go, please be honest with me. Free agency just started. Do you want me on your hockey team or not? 
This is my last opportunity. I just got bought out. You know this. I know this. This is my last chance. Do you want me on the hockey team or not? Are you going to give me an opportunity or not? Or are you just getting me here to end my career? This is it for me. I understand that. No, 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 Mike. We need a right-handed defenseman. We need a physical presence. We need somebody to play with Nick. I'm like, Babs, last chance. There's no hard feelings here. If you don't want me, I'm going to say no, and I'll go somewhere else, else hopefully later in the summer. No, no, no. I need you, need you, want you, blah, blah, blah. Hang up the phone. <laughs> I got five minutes left before this contract's gone. With no guarantee I'm going to get anything if I let this pass. So my gut is screaming, don't go to Detroit. You know this guy. He All he's going to want to do is screw you. Call my agent. He's like, what do he say? I, I'm like, well, he said this. He's like, what do you, I go, I think he's going to screw me. He's like, Mike, you know, play with Nick a little bit. Like, man, you're going to be in the playoffs. And so then I start thinking about that. I'm like, oh, Nick Lidstrom, yeah. D to D, that's going to yeah. be 30, 40 <laughs> points for me. This is going to be an awesome year. So I take Babs at his word, sign that contract, get in there. And I was out from the word go. Like he wouldn't even let me practice. I wasn't able to do all the drills. He was calling guys up from the minors to keep me scratched. Like it was a disaster. Why, why, why do you think, I mean, and there, and so Kenny's got to pay you. I mean, you're getting paid. So I I don't understand the, you think he actually brought you in there to end your career? There's no doubt. There's no doubt. Like at no point during that season, did he even like, like consider playing me? And like, like the first game I didn't play until I think my first game with the Red Wings was like the first half of November. I haven't played an NHL game in like almost a year, except the exhibition. He played me in a couple exhibition games and like, he's calling up guys from the minors to keep like, I'm sitting there, I'm healthy. Like, Oh, you want to change the lineup up or somebody gets dinged up? Like, no, you're staying, you're not playing. I'm going to call up Brendan Smith or whoever else from the minors. So, like, he's going out of his way so I don't play. I don't know why he didn't want anything to do with me. I had never had anything to do with him, period, before I met him in Anaheim. So I really don't know what it was ever. He's gone on record, like, a couple times, like, in the last couple years, because obviously I spent, I spent, well, I've eased off since he got canned in Toronto, but I spent four or five years ripping him online. Um, and he's, you know, he said, well, you got to be able to play, but it's like, dude, like I've, <laughs> like, I get what you're saying. Like, if you're looking for Nick Lindstrom, I'm not your guy, <laughs> yeah. but it's like, dude, I also accomplished some things and you're sitting here telling me that I can play and that you're going to give me an opportunity. So I know you're full of shit. So I don't, for the life of me, I, I don't think I'll ever know what it was or what it is. Maybe it's just one of those things he didn't like the looks of me. I have no clue. Uh, and then the other one was Hall of Famer Mike Badano. And, you know, what he did to Mo was, you know, and I, I saved that question till near the end of the podcast, and I wasn't sure how Mike was going to talk about it. And, you know, to Mike's credit, very, very candid and, and spoke about it. Clip it along, get the 1497 Everybody knows what's going on in the media, the players, you know, oh, we're all talking about, you know, t- oh, man, Minnesota, against Minnesota, at home, 1,500, how cool is that? You know, wake up from my nap on the, the game, the day of the wild game, and, and Babcock calls to tell me he was going to leave me out of the game. So I was like, I, I was dumb. I mean, did you think he was serious? I was at at first, I, not not at first. I thought you know he was going to say, "Hey, you're God, you're coming up to that number. We're excited for you, just to give you, you know, you got two more hanging, you know, give you one of those deals." And and it didn't come after he was like, "I'm going to have you out tonight for, you know, this game tonight." I was like, I I was just kind of caught off guard. I didn't know what to say. So he hang, he, you know, we hang up, and I'm like. So I get ready. I go to the game. I'm around, and you know, there's the lineup on the board. And I was like, and everybody's looking at the board and the lineup in the locker room. The assistant coaches, McCrimmon was there, McLean, all those guys. And you know, at the time, those guys were scared to death. Everybody was scared to death to say something to, to Babcock, and no one said anything. And I was like, yeah, like, can't believe it. 
So I'm going to go to Chicago and play the next game and, and get fourteen ninety nine. dollars mm-hmm. like, Yeah. And so his reason is, Mike, we didn't bring you in here to play 1,500 games. We brought you in here to win a Stanley Cup. <laughs> How does that um, sit with you? <laughs> so that right there just deflated my existence of playing. I did not want to. That did it. I was, I was like, I'm playing. What happens? Whatever happens the rest of the way, I'm done. I'm, I'm not playing anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm retiring after this year. I played two games in the playoffs, and uh, you know that was it. So I was like, uh, basically, Mo was there, sitting on 1,499 games played, and did not play him the rest of the year uh, to get his 1,500th game. So you want to talk about a kick in the nuts to a Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame player, a guy that never ruffled any feathers and, and you know Mo Mo's Mo doesn't Mo a lot of times wouldn't say shit if he had a mouthful. Yeah. He's just he just does his business. You know, the rest of us chirp and all this other kind yeah. of stuff. So there are three guys that we did podcasts with last year and they all I mean nobody saw this coming, but they kind of did uh because they just said he 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 was an ass. And um so anyways um, yeah, I, you know, again, I, what I don't understand about some of this, you know, I've been working with our 17 and 18 kids with our Dallas Stars elite team. Um, you know, they're a triple A club and we play 60 to 65 games a year with them. We travel around the country and things like that, but we have to do something called uh, safe sport every year. And, it, and it's, you do it online and it basically you're keeping up to date with how do you handle this situation? How do you handle if you hear this conversation going on in the locker room? How do you handle something on a bus? Um, you know, going into a uh, into a, a restroom if one of the players in there. All these kind of things, and you have to take this test, and it's a refresher every year. And things change, and because the world is changing, and so you have to kind of know what to deal with, what not to do. It's more about what not to do than what to do. Um, it's on the ice and stuff like that. As far as I'm concerned, the way I speak to players, it's a little old school, but I think they understand where I'm coming from. I you know, I can talk hard to a player, but I'll go up to them right after I say it and say, do you understand what I'm talking about? And they're like, yeah. So so I, I don't know why they don't have things like that with coaches because, you know, and again, there's been a lot for a long time, Brads, and I, you can speak about all the other sports. It's kind of been the old boys club, right? right. I mean, they recycle the coaches that have been around for years and years and years. And I think it's changing a little bit. And I truly believe that there needs to be – you can have an old school coach in there that's had success and sticking around, but I think you need some younger coaches that have coached in either the junior levels or the college level or even the, 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 the level that we are. But because you get to learn what makes these kids tick today. You can listen and you can read, but you need to live it and you need to know the signs. I can see signs from certain kids that are they're quiet kids. There's cocky kids, there's confident kids, and I talk to them differently. I, you know, and I may be harder on the cocky kid than I am on on the the kid that's really shy and quiet. And you can just see by their mannerisms how they go about. And so you get, you have to try to find a way to get into each one of those guys so that they can trust you, knowing that you will give them. If, I, if you don't do it right, I'm going to give you shit. But it doesn't mean I I don't want you on the team or anything like that. You know. So I, I just wonder why they don't have more of that or maybe they will implement and the other the other uh, spot that you got to give credit to is the, the player association those guys got wind of this whole thing whether somebody called them they they flew in and they met with the players they met i believe they met i don't know who they all met with but they did their due diligence and at the end of it it was like no this guy cannot be coaching that's why i say maybe you and snoop on a beach someday <laughs> That's that's your your last chance. So uh, let me just play devil's advocate a little bit. And again, where I come from, and you know this, Luds, I'm a Detroit guy. Babcock, you know, took the Red Wings to the Stanley Cup, won the Stanley Cup in 2008. You know, he brought them over the top and and got to that point, obviously. And I, I you know, I, I, I we just heard the comments from Mo. A monkey could have coached that fucking team. Possibly, a monkey could have coached that team. They were so good. Yeah, they were pretty good. But he well, got maybe there that. was one coach in the he, team. Now, that, if you listen to what people are calling them, maybe they that's what they thought. But I'm telling you, they they were, yeah, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Oh. So anyway, but, but but what we've already heard from Chelly, you know, and from Mo, you know, and from Commodore is all that this is a bad guy, right? But I'm not sure yeah. that what, what precipitated this 
is so bad. I mean, again, there's two sides to every story. He says he's just trying to get to know these guys and their families. And, and as you said, Boone Jenner, the captain, you know, Goudreau, they were like, it's fine. We show him a few pictures. He showed us pictures of his family. Now, uh, I get and I also get that the younger guys, if, you know, a couple of them, they weren't, they didn't name names, but a couple of them said, yeah, it was looking a little too long at my thing. Well, a lot of these guys might have, you know, pictures from their girlfriends and stuff like that, that, you know, he may have been mm-hmm. leering at. And mm-hmm. that's, uh, you know, that's very uncomfortable. So we don't know exactly what happened there, but it does seem to me like this is that same thing about, you know, this younger generation of athlete being so thin skinned that, you know, if you violate this little, uh, you know, thing of mine, you know, you, you're completely dead to me. Now, maybe, maybe all of them just knew that from, you know, word gets around, this is a bad guy. We don't want him, you know, yelling and screaming at us in an old school style every day. So you seize an opportunity, right? He does this. Right. That's bad. Let's seize this opportunity and get him out of here before he has a chance to sit us out when we're on fourteen ninety nine and don't go. But um, I don't know. I, in your safe sport, do they say you can't look at the kid's cell phone? Right. You, you see what I'm saying? I mean, is that is that something that that coaches should know is taboo? That is not part of the test. That question did not come up in the test, but I can promise you it'll come up next year. Yeah. That that will be that will be part of it. It'll probably be about social media and all. I th- I don't recall those questions on there. I got nine out of ten right in the final test, though. So I, wow. I'm pretty proud of myself. And gotcha. you got well, you got you got to read shit, then you got to watch a video, and then you get multiple a question, and you get multiple questions at the end of it, or multi, you know, what, what a b. It's like fuck, I didn't even do that when it was in college, much <laughs> less now, you know, and. <laughs> So it, it's kind of like all coming full circle. So I was actually shocked. But you have to go through all these tests. Now, you have to go through all these quizzes until you get to the final one. And if you don't get enough right after you watch the video, you have to go back, watch the video again. And it recognizes if you watch it or not. You have to watch it again. And then you have to answer the same questions again. Because they don't give you the answer, the correct answer. Okay. Like if you say A and a C, they, don't, they just said, nope, wrong answer. Done. And then so you go on to the next nine. Then if you don't get, I don't know what it is, maybe six or seven correct, you got to go back, watch the video, and then do it all over again. So I'm sure because of this, there's going to be a lot of things that change. Yeah. I, I think this is just the beginning. Um, and again, uh, th- this is not to say that this generation is soft. They're not. They're anything but. But they're a different player. They play a different style of game. And and we're all adjusting to that, that are old school guys. We, we'd love to see them be more physical. We would love – like, uh, you know <clears> – <throat> I was used to getting yelled at at a coach. I mean, Mike Madonna was yeah. getting used to getting Hitchcock yelled right. at him. But Mo's the first guy at his induction. Who does he bring up? Yeah, Hitch. Ken Hitchcock. Yep. Who does Zuby bring up? Ken Hitchcock. Hitch. You know. So, and I'm Holly. I mean, these guys. But again, that's a different generation than right now. But that's the way it was. It's not like that now. And so, like I say, in my opinion, you just have to, you have to get, and Babcock wanted to learn and get to know his players. He just went way too far yeah. in getting to know them. Yeah. And he did invade their privacy. I mean, you talk about the Detroit Red Wings, talk about that team. You know how this all got started was by one of those Red Wing players was Holmstrom. He verbally, apparently, allegedly, well, Holmstrom's come out and said it now. He abused him wow. and told him he was overweight and he was too fat and he was soft. And if you if you're played against guy, you know he's a great player. And um, so anyway, but but again, that was in at a time when you probably didn't come out and say anything. You didn't want to come out and let the coach know that you were calling you this and calling right. you that. Now they do. Yeah. And so, I, you know, bottom line is he, did, he didn't adapt and he didn't learn by yeah. anything. It yeah. Sounds like. And I love what you were saying about your approach to your kids, because I've always said the best coaches in any sport are those that have a little bit of psychologist in them, right? You've got to be able to read the people, read the room, if you will, yep. and know what is going to make this kid tick. The shy kid, you got to be a little easier on. The cocky kid, a little harder. I remember uh, back in the day, I did a radio show way back when Leroy Glover played for the Cowboys, and uh, Parcells was the coach then. And he said, and Le- Le- Glover was telling me, yeah, walking out to practice today, early in the season, walking out to practice, and, and Parcells walks by me, and he goes, Glover, 
You walk like a duck. You don't even look like an athlete. What the heck are you doing out here? And goes on about his business. I says to Glover, how'd you practice that day? He says, I tore people up, right? And so, <laughs> right, because yeah. I'm going to show you, coach. You think I'm a duck? You think I'm not an athlete? And, and I think Parcells knew um, that that, was what maybe would inspire Glover, right, in that sense. And it's the same thing with you. Jimmy Johnson was a master psychologist in that regard. And, you know, and Hitch, I think, had some of that in him, too. I mean, uh, he, he, was, he, he was a little more indiscriminate with the yelling. I think he, you know, volume. And- well, I'll t- so I, uh, you know, Hitch, Hitch had reached out to me a couple times since I was done. And, and I, uh, this is where I, uh, I think I got a, a different perspective. Um, but, I, but I, I was in the office almost on a daily thing, but it was more of being conduit between yep. the coaching staff and our players. Yep. And so, Hey, Luds, you got to go talk to so-and-so Luds got And I'm thinking, Jesus, why don't you bring me it? So, but he, he knew what he was doing, but there was one year he, uh, he said, he called me up and he said, Hey, Luds, I, I need you to write me a paper. I was like, what? And I even said to him, I said, Hitch, do you know who you just dialed? Like, <laughs> you know, you know who you're talking to here, right? Write you a paper. I'm like, what do you want me here? He goes, he goes, I'm I'm having a hard time getting through to our players. He goes, I need you to write something down how you dealt with me from a player to a coach. And so we, we had that conversation and I asked him, you know, is it a certain guy? And he told me yes and who it was and it made sense that, you know, one of your leaders. But what it told me was he was trying to evolve. He was trying to understand how to get to a certain player. But Hitch has said, he goes, I will cause chaos and give shit to players on purpose as a group, not as an individual, as a group. He goes, I don't care if they bark at me. I want them to bark at me. I want them to rally around each other in spite of me. And and he would always say, Let's you know you know when I finally got to you guys whether it was a system or traveling around the big thing was is like we would we would go to Colorado for training camps and so we'd go to Vail which for me I hated it because of the altitude I can't breathe around here much less running and riding on a bike and shit like that yeah. unless it's got a motor up between my legs but <clears throat> but what but what he said you know what we get to training camps we're out having coffee the coaches and stuff like that and we see three four guys walking together. And then there goes another of five, six guys. And then there goes two guys. And he goes, by day three, we have 10 guys. And then we see another 12. And then we see 15 guys all going to the same bar, the same restaurant. That's that's He's just trying to build that chemistry yep. and that camaraderie between the clubs. He goes, I don't care if they yell at me and scream at me because they all rally around. And he goes, it brings the group together. He goes, it doesn't. And I know it didn't bother him, but he will go up and he'll talk to you later. He'll, he'll, but, but he has a, he had a reason why he wanted to do it. He is now a hall of fame coach. Um, so it worked for him, but again, different time. But like I say, he just by reaching, I know I'm not the only guy he reached out to. I'm probably the last guy he reached out to to just say, Hey, how did you handle me? But there's signs of trying to understand the new generation of players. And, and I, to this day, I, I find, I mean, I can call Hitch right now, but, um, and we did a little thing with him last year too, and very candid and stuff like that. And it was prior to him being uh, inducted in the hall of fame, but, but I will pull up on YouTube because they do a lot of coaching clinics yeah. and things like that. And, and they'll, you, you'll find them on YouTube and there was stuff. I'll, I'll take it into the room and I'll say, Addy, listen to this. And you know, here, here's how he wanted this drill to be run, and Here's why you want to run this drill. So anyways, I, I have a ton of respect for that guy. Um, anyway, like I said, it, it, it's a different time. And if you don't want to work at, at, you know, that, that part of the game now, which is even more important than it used to be. I mean, you talk to Al Arbor and, and, and I played for Al, another hall of fame coach for a short while. And, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I mentioned a couple other guys, but, but you knew exactly where you stood when you left that room. If you went in for a meeting, you knew exactly where it was. I mean, I was there with Pat Burns after we were in the playoff game and, and, and Bernsey was a cop in Montreal and for 20 years. So he knew where we were all the time, which you needed to know where we were yeah. all the time in Montreal. And so he could use that little bit of info. But he called me in after a playoff game and he said, sit down. And uh, and we actually lost the game. And I'm like, oh, shit, I'm not He's calling me out tomorrow night or something like that. And he goes, he asked me, he goes, what did you do last night? And this is the night before the game. And um, I told him because I know he knows. Yeah. And he goes, did you make it in for curfew? I'm like, no, nah, I was a little late. He goes, oh, and I'm waiting for it, and I'm waiting for it. And he goes, you know what? Do the same thing tonight. You had a great game. 
I was like, well, there's the green light. Wow. But it wasn't a green light. I could read between the lines. He, he knew where I was. Uh, you know, I'll go have a few beers, but I'm not going to push the limits because now I know he's got eyes on me or whoever it may be. But different tactics for different players. You know what I mean? So, yeah. I mean, and, talking and about that. The, like, the go ahead. bottom line seems to be that Babcock has never done that. Right. I mean, you know, Correct. you talk to guys who had him throughout the course of the career and and he just he doesn't appear to be a guy who's ever done that. Uh, exactly. And that's what every player says. He never he just wanted to be the ruler and and he he was he was the alpha male and everybody else was not. And you're not worthy. Uh, and again, the one thing you can't criticize him for is it wasn't the fourth line. It was, he would do it to the top guys, yeah. the middle guys. He would do it to everybody. So, you know, and, and on that note, like talk about coaches, Deion Sanders, we talked about Deion last week and yeah. I hope you're making some progress getting up on the show, but yeah, but he did the 60 minute piece, right? He did that the other night and yeah. I, I missed a little bit of it and I, I found it online and he made a comment uh, in there. I mean, he's a confident guy, but, yeah. but for good reason, yeah. he, he had said something like, these guys, these kids didn't come here because it's the Colorado University. He says they came here because of me. I, I And I believe that. I believe that those players, whoever those 85 or 87, whatever it was, number, they came there because of Dion. So Dion's a very confident guy. We know that. But he can back it up. And, you know, early on he's having some success, which you know better to speak about that than me. It's unbelievable what he's doing. And, you know, th there is – um, it's not like everybody in the world agrees with his approach, right? I mean, obviously, they got higher ratings for that game against Colorado State uh, than the Texas-Alabama game had gotten the week before, right? And the Colorado State-Colorado game ended at 125 our time. So it was a very late game. 3.9 million viewers, right? So that speaks to how he has kind of captured the nation. But I believe, maybe not half, but a lot of those people are watching, hoping that this experiment with Deion Sanders doesn't work. Now, we're not two of those people. When I watch, I'm rooting for Dion. I think what he's doing there is unbelievable. And, and what people... Uh, don't understand if they're rooting against him is that all of the brash and all of the bravado and on 60 minutes, they said, you know, who's the best coach in college football. And he's like, you think I'm going to say anybody, but mirror. me, I'm going to say me. Yeah. You know? What do you, who do you think I am? You know? And then he did go on in fairness. He did go on to praise Nick Saban, who has proven mm -hmm. that he, you know, has all those skins on the wall, but, but, Dion is like, no, nobody's better than me at the things that I do. And that rubs a lot of people the wrong way. But I believe that what Dion is, is a master of the um, marketing, right? And of getting the attention for his group, his team, his cause, his whatever it might be. And he has done that so amazing. Of course, three wins helps, but He's done it unbelievably well in attracting the attention that will put Colorado over the top. No question. Maybe even, you know, take them into like a, a situation where they have a chance to be in the, you know, in the final four and all that other stuff. Or, uh, but at very least, it's going to put them, they've already sold out every game for the season. They don't usually do that. It's unbelievable from 1-11 and 11 last year. But there are people out there who, who, who the, all that stuff rubs them so the wrong way. And you have to realize that the other side of Dion is the one that we saw online this week where, you know, there was that big hit against Travis Hunter last week and uh, uh, the Colorado State kid just laid a lick on him and Hunter got hurt and all that other stuff. And um, anyway, there were death threats uh, against the Colorado State kid that, that laid that hit on him. And Dion came out and said, whoa, 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 this is a game. That is a good player. He made a great play in an important game. Stop it. And if it's, he said, if it's the Colorado fans, I'm disappointed in you. Stop it. Don't give this kid death threats. This is a kid that, you know, wants to get his college education and go on and play in the NFL. So leave him alone. And, and those are the kinds of things that would probably, uh, those who don't like his brashness and his bravado, they would think, yeah, well, you know, he's, uh, you know, he, he would, but he's, he's, complete. Dion is a complete guy. He's, you and I know he's a good man 
And, and, um, I, I'm just, I'm real proud of the job that he's doing at, at Colorado. And, and by the way, Jerry Jones w- was quoted after the Cowboys game this week saying, Hey, I watched every play of that Colorado game rooting for Dion. And then unsolicited, nobody asked. He said, I think he'll make a great coach in the NFL someday. So. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see if he wants to do that because he did make a comment about that. He goes, I can't get the players that are that are making 10, 15, 20 million dollars a year. So it'd be interesting if he would want to take that step. I, when you talk about the ratings and all that kind of stuff in the school, the game, the all the games being sold out. Do coaches or do you think he has anything where he gets a percentage of any of that that the school is benefiting off of him coming to that team? Because I saw something, I think it was this morning, the sunglasses that he wears, they sold four million dollars or four and a half million dollars. They sold them, they made replicas of those sunglasses. Four and a half million dollars from the company that made those replicas, whether that's true or not. But do coaches have any kind of incentive like that? Do I mean players are getting paid now? I mean, so does does Dion have any cut of games being sold out and memorabilia and, and, and if they're buying his sunglasses or his jersey coming from the school, not from Nike or anything else like that? Yeah, I think that like on the sunglass deal, I think that's a deal that he brokered for himself. So he's making money off of that sunglass deal, right, on his own without mm-hmm. not even going through the university. So that's one. But when you, but your question is good because I noticed or I saw something that said, and you know, there's a, obviously a whole bunch of CU Buffalo shirts that just say Prime on them, and then have the Buffalo or you know Prime going down the shirt and whatever. And those the sales of those yep. are up three or four hundred percent of just Colorado Buffalo memorabilia, right? And I don't know the answer to if the coaches get that. You know, he's a smart guy, so it wouldn't be surprising to me. And his age, I don't know if his agent is still Eugene Parker. I think it might be, and Parker's a smart guy. And um, so it, it wouldn't surprise me that they thought of that. And the classic example of someone who couldn't do anything about that back in the day is that Johnny football, Johnny Manziel, right? I mean, he brought Texas A&M so much money in that one year that, that he won the Heisman and that they beat Alabama in Tuscaloosa that he brought them so much money. They basically leveled the stadium and built a new one. I mean, millions and millions and millions of dollars and he got nothing for it. Right. Because again, in those days, players couldn't, there's a documentary out about, Johnny football and it's a good one and it just shows wow what a what a ride that was and he he basically you know I mean and he tried he had a couple of you know deals on the side working that were certainly against NCAA violations and all that stuff but he um he he brought that university so much notoriety and that's exactly what Dion is doing to Colorado right now of course the players are making it happen too but Dion brought the players in yeah, I, I watched that documentary probably about four or five nights ago. It was real good. I, I loved it. I've never been a, a big college football fan. Yeah, I, I never have been. I'm, I'm more the NFL and not. I'm, I'm not a big basketball fan in general. But I would never watch college basketball. Don't know enough about it, anyways. And but but anyway, um, you know, it it get Dion got me to. I watch. I've watched all three of Colorado's yeah. games already, yeah. and it's not because of the team. It's because of Dion, and I want the camera on him. I want to see how he because I can learn things just yeah. from him. The way he yeah. sees a player that made a mistake, and how does he go up to him, and th- that he might he approaches the player in a different way. So, a uh, big big fan of Dion Sanders, and I uh, man, I. I wish them all the best. And like I said, I'm not even a college football fan, but I want to bring it back to the old guys. Now we talked about the stars off the top uh, coming up this week. And uh, you probably don't know about this Raz, but we got a big thing called the big hearts. Oh wow. And what we do is um, there will be, I think there's somewhere between 16 and 18 teams this year. We have a draft on uh, Thursday night. So that'll be on the 27th on the 28th is the game. <clears throat> there's a big draft at Co America here in Frisco and there's uh, 18 teams. I think they're made up of 15, 15 to 18 players on each team. There will be a draft. And so that team will actually draft uh, one of the players. Darian Hatch is going to be here. Uh, Matt Fachuk is going to be here. Uh, Fids plays. Uh, uh, we had Madano here one. We had Brett Hull is coming in, but he's not going to play. He'll be there for the draft on 
basically he'll be there for the free drinks on uh, Thursday <laughs> night. The, the draft is a big deal. They have a big – the whole floor is <laughs> roped off carpet, and then we'll be, go up on stage, and they'll kind of – raffle off the players and things like that. Last year I had heard we did over uh, the alumni. It's some some good money, and it all goes to the Hart Foundation, so it's for a good charity. Um, and then on Friday after the draft, that that's a rough one. So this kind of takes us back to the old day where yeah. you had a curfew, but you ain't getting back for the curfew on Thursday night. And then we'll start playing games at 8 a.m., and we play five games on Friday. <laughs> now, the games are only I, – I think they're like 15 minutes long possibly and they're straight time or maybe they're 30 minutes with two 15s, whatever it is, but it's straight time. But anyway, and you play back-to-back -back or you'll play a game in between. And they're played in McKinney and Frisco, I believe, is where they're going to be played. But anyway, it's a good time. Uh, it's for a great cause and there will be some unbelievable um, – things on Thursday night and what can the, the way you get up in the draft order is it's how much you raised coming into it and how much you spend on Thursday night uh, so there could be you know one group of guys and they may have a sponsor whatever it may be and if they, they end up with twenty five thirty thousand dollars and being the top thing they get to pick first so Ray Bork has gone first Shane Corson's gone first obviously Madonna's gone first uh Belfour would go first I don't know if Eddie's playing this year I would probably guess he would be but but anyway so it's a real good event um and I'm I'm hoping that uh because uh Matt Fachuk and Hatcher are coming we did a podcast with Hatch last year actually at the uh, Sandman um, out there in Plano, Plano for area yep. uh, at the Moxie's bar that they have in the hotel there. Um, so I'm hoping to have Matty, uh, Matt Fachuk and Hatcher possibly um, wow. next week, which would be, a, which would be a good one. You know, them two guys were partners for a long time. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if you could de uh, design two better guys to play together um, when, when they were in their prime. So um, I'm looking forward to that um it ends up being a long <laughs> long 24 48 hours for for everybody and i i just happened to look at hatchy's flight on um so the games are friday on saturday morning i never accused him of being a real smart guy but he's flying out at 7 a.m back oh, to detroit or wherever he's going oh, so apparently it's going from this thing to the airport so yeah. anyway, yeah. looking forward to that again. We, we this is I don't know four, five, six. Well, how many have ever been? So, but it's 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 a great time. It's for a great charity. Marty Turco um, does an incredible job. Um, you know, a lot of those dollars are are going to you know to the Stars Foundation that Mar Marty's in charge of. Marty's always done a great job, and and I, and he's passionate about what he does. So looking forward to that. And then our alumni director, I can't cannot not mention Bobby Basson. Bobby Basson is the director of our alumni association, and between Marty and Basson, what they do for for the alumni. Alumni and you know now we're we're at the point with our alumni where you know we're we're taking our show on the road and we played we play a game every year here at uh, American Airlines. Uh, last year it was the Rangers. I think before that it was Detroit. Um, so we'll get those alumni to play some games. Last year the guys went to Chicago. I was on the road with our team, so I missed that one of all places. And Chelly was there, and I missed it. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> anyway, and another shout out to Chris Chelios. Part of the podcast that I did with Chelly mentioned, I asked Chelly, I said, man, you know, you got three Stanley cups, hall of fame, blah, 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 blah. I said, um, and I asked Mo this, I asked all those guys the same thing. What's more important to you? Is it the Stanley cup or is it the hall of fame? Like, I, I'm just curious. I mean, what, what means more to you? And, and I remember Chelly saying, uh, to be honest with you, let's neither one. I'm like, yeah, okay. Now you're blowing smoke up my ass. And he goes, no. He goes, I would love to see my jersey retired in the Chicago Stadium. I said, really? He goes, yeah, I'd love to see it hang in the rafters. Uh, you know, those other things are great. He goes, but that someday when I'm gone, my kids will see my jersey wow. hanging in yeah. the rafters in Chicago. Now, Shelly Chel played uh, seven years or so in, in um, Montreal where I was with him. Eight years, I believe, in Chicago, Chicago and 10 years Detroit. in Detroit. Yeah. And and so lo and behold, uh Pearl Jam, Vetter, at a concert two weeks ago that Shelly was at. They're good buddies. They're Malibu buddies. Uh Eddie Vetter. Um Shelly was at the concert and is and it was in, I think it was in Chicago actually. Uh he was at a concert at the concert, Pearl Jam's there, Vetter's playing. And all of a sudden, Shelly says he looks up on the Jumbotron, and he's on the Jumbotron. And oh, naturally, you're going to be on Jumbotron in Chicago. Yeah. Well, Vetter calls him up on stage. And so they're, they're talking. 
and which this isn't the first group Shelly's done this with. But so they're talking, and all of a sudden on the Jumbotron, they're showing Shelly's jersey. Shelly is having his jersey retired in the Chicago Stadium uh, in February. Wow. On, uh, like a Monday, uh, yeah, on the 24th. So it's funny how and that was the one thing he wanted. That's probably because he listened to the podcast. You know, everybody's listened to this podcast. That's exactly so what it is. Good for Chris Chelios. Eddie, Eddie yeah. Vetter broke the news to him, though? Was that the first he'd heard of he it? Bro- he broke the news. Oh, that's fantastic. He said he had no idea. He goes, he goes, I'm standing up there, and he goes, I'm looking at her. I'm, first, I'm down in the, you know, in the mosh pit area, and he goes, ah, you, know, and I, you know, they're showing me up here and stuff like that, and Vetter's up there, and then Vetter starts talking after the song. He goes, hey, my buddy here, Chris, hey, Chelly, come on up on stage here. And then they get up there and have a little conversation, it sounded like. And then all of a sudden, they're showing his jersey. And he said, I still didn't know what was going on. And he's the one that broke the news to Chelly. Uh, so anyway, and I mean, what a creative way to do it. You yeah, know? And, that's awesome. And Chelly talked about it the other day. Chelly was on uh, Spitting Chicklets talking about this whole Babcock thing and also. And he was talking about Chicago fans. He goes, when I went to Detroit – he goes, you know, for this first couple of years, he goes, I couldn't come back to Chicago. He said, people hated me. He goes, they wanted to get in a fight with me on the streets. <laughs> they were giving shit to my kids because, but, but it was that Blackhawks didn't want Shelly back. He goes, I didn't want to leave. He yeah. goes, I just wanted some security. Yeah. I just want to, and they didn't want to do that. And he, and they, you know, they, they could, Hey, Shelly, we'll give you, we'll give you another year or something like that. And Shelly says, well, you know, they didn't do that. And I just went on to play another 10 years in Detroit. So yeah. he says, I think they thought my best years were behind me. And then he won another Stanley Cup there. But but good for them because they ultimately went on and won three Stanley Cups yeah, of their own. The Blackhawks okay. did after yeah. Chelly took off. So, yeah. yeah. Anyway, you got anything else, Rats? Or no, we that sounds, but that sounds fun. We'll t- look, we need to try and do the podcast up there next week at the draft or something. You got it. I'm, I'm working on it. Beautiful. I'm working on it. Beautiful. All right. Well, there, there's another one in the books. Uh this is Suds with Rads and Luds now. We don't know how long Rads is going to be around. I'm sure they're going to get the big deal done, and hopefully for our sake he's not because uh, you're, you're, a, you're a book of uh, sports knowledge, Rads, and it's a pleasure having you on here. So, fun, man. It's really again. fun. I love it. Thank you, brother. We'll talk to you soon. 